According to the legends of North America's First Nations people, when humans began to walk the earth, it was the coyote who taught them how to survive. Then European settlers moved in and transformed the continent. Many wild animals were driven into extinction, but coyotes thrived. Today, scientists consider them an evolutionary marvel, an animal of a thousand faces, capable of adapting to a thousand different ecosystems. Now new studies are revealing the coyote's astonishing secrets of survival. What are those secrets? Well, it depends on where the coyotes are. They seem to change every place they go, and along the way, they've created a new legend as a modern-day shapeshifter. Coyotes can be found almost everywhere in North America. In the last hundred years, they followed roads and railways from remote wilderness through urban jungles all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. A new predator hadn't been introduced into eastern North America for over a century before the coyote arrived. And from here all the way back to the Pacific coast, there may be 20 million of them. No one really knows. Now, especially in rural areas like Canada's Prince Edward Island, nerves are on edge. It's a modern day word you call it, stress. <laughs> yeah, stress on everybody, animals included. It shows on your lambs especially. It takes lambs up to a month longer to go to market. From the coyote's point of view, humans are generous creatures. They thoughtfully cleared out the wolves, cultivated fields to wander through, and provided plenty of high-protein food to help coyote pups grow big and strong. Humans, however, don't see it quite that way. Normally, you would check them once a week, probably, just to make sure that there was no sickness or any problems developed. But with them around, it's a, it's a daily thing. Losing several calves a year to coyotes has outraged farmers like Elmer Larson. Just this past spring now, we had uh, a cow had uh, twins. When we come down, uh, she was there with one calf. The other calf was there with the whole side tore off it and, and uh, all the front shoulder and all everything tore apart on it. You see them things tearing young animals apart. Oh, I tell you, it's a, it's a sorry sight. If I seen him in the field, I would shoot him and ask questions after. I think the only response is complete eradication and as soon as possible. It's a popular sentiment. Humans kill about 400,000 coyotes every year. But wildlife experts have found that the population has only grown larger. The idea of trying to eliminate coyotes has been tried for uh, in excess of 100 years. They've been poisoned, trapped, shot, shot from aircraft. They have tried everything to get rid of them. But they're virtually impossible to eliminate. No other animal has ever survived such a massive attempt to wipe them out. How do they do it? What is it that makes coyotes so unique? In the 21st century, North America is coyote country, all of it. Every backyard, city park, vacant sidewalk and alleyway on the continent has, is or will be part of the coyote's territory. There seems to be no escape. Coyotes may be wild animals, but they've clearly found a home in every corner of the human world. Now urban wildlife experts are in a hurry to find out why coyotes adapt so well to so many different environments. What's interesting about coyotes in the city is they're not here because habitat elsewhere has been removed. They're here because we've created habitat for them. The animal is, is very adaptable very intelligent and very opportunistic, and they recognize a good thing when they see it. Urban coyotes are just like smart supermarket shoppers, always on the hunt for a good bargain. Coyotes will try anything to learn if it's edible, and the city's bargain bin banquet always has something tasty to offer. A 
Across the continent, coyote populations are expanding dramatically. There's food everywhere. And now, from the wilderness to both rural and urban environments, everybody, it seems, has got a story to tell about coyotes. The shapeshifter of the modern world raises ancient primal fears. It's more than scattered garbage and a few lost cats. Coyotes are thriving in the face of a systematic campaign from coast to coast to get rid of them. So far, their incredible skills of survival have confounded us all. The Lamar Valley in Yellowstone National Park is the last best place to experience the ancient wild spirit of North America. It's a high country Eden, the world's greatest place to observe wildlife. It's also the evolutionary birthplace of coyotes. In this primordial protected western wilderness lie many of the secrets of the coyote's modern day success. Scientists have been studying Lamar Valley's coyotes for decades. The valley is a gigantic outdoor laboratory. Here, a new biological profile of coyotes is emerging, hidden among the continent's oldest survivors. Dr. Bob Crabtree has been observing coyotes here for the past 13 years, the world's longest ongoing study of coyotes in the wild. This morning, Bob and his research team are searching for a coyote den site. The bread and the fish. Yeah. We'll bring that. We'll work over there, okay. kind of maybe below the ridge rear, and kind of be looking down on these terraces. Nine pups are up somewhere behind the hill. Yeah, here. up over the ranger hill that we call right up to up the left, the top. and then over the top. Yeah. And we know she had nine. At least nine. Yeah. So I'd be surprised if they're all still here, but she's a pretty impressive female. Maybe she's still got nine alive. Uh, I can see we're going to get our feet wet today. Bob Crabtree hopes that by studying how coyote families behave in the wild, he might find answers to why they survive so well outside the park in the human world. There's some pretty intense uh, management to exclude coyotes to lessen the amount of livestock that are killed. It's just, it's very difficult to achieve those goals. In fact, in most cases, humans fail at eradicating coyotes. It's like a football game and the score is coyotes 63, humans three. It's very few instances where uh, humans can even score a success. The plains of the Lamar Valley are filled with ancient species, like the pronghorn, North America's fastest animal. From these hills, it's easy to watch wildlife in the valley below. This is one of the last wild places where the habitat can still support all the animals that were here when Columbus set foot on the continent over 500 years ago. The last free-roaming plains bison find refuge here remnants of a herd that once numbered 60 million. For their part, coyotes have been here for almost three million years. Unique to North America, they're the continent's oldest indigenous species. Grizzly bears wander through the valley in the spring. Relaxed and content in this protected area, these powerful predators can barely survive outside the park, but it doesn't make them any less intimidating. Bob Crabtree has found that coyotes are quite different from all the other animals in the park. They can survive anywhere, as long as they can find what they need. Within a coyote system, it takes two things to directly pass on your genes to your offspring. That is reproducing. You gotta have a mate, alpha male and female pair bond, and you have to have a territory that's defended to keep other coyotes out. So there's lots of competition for space, because with space comes good food, good den sites, and the ability to attract a mate and successfully have pups that survive. Smaller than a wolf, the coyote's size is another key to their adaptability. They can take down a young pronghorn or survive on insects. Ground squirrels are the coyote's main food in Yellowstone. It takes several to make a meal, but the fields are crawling with them.
While the alpha female is off raising the pups, the alpha male defends his family's territory by making sure other coyotes keep their distance. In the Lamar Valley, all creatures, large or small, have claimed their own little piece of Eden. Coyotes have a complex fluid social structure, much like wolves. The alphas mate for life, but when the pups grow up, they usually move on to start their own families. In a coyote's territory, Bob Crabtree knows to be careful. If the alpha female gets nervous, she'll move the den immediately to ensure that the young pups remain hidden and safe. Coyotes are extremely cunning animals. If an alpha male knows he's being watched, he'll purposely walk away from the den. And if these scientists fall for the trick, they might also see their research grants disappear over the next hill. From past experience, Bob Crabtree knows that coyotes, long considered tricksters by First Nation peoples, do have a sense of humor, and when it comes to humans, a unique sense of coyote justice. One particular alpha male I'll never forget, I was really out to trap him. I had caught his mate, a female, in a trap, and that uh, alpha male tried to pull that female out of the trap, which is a fairly high level of reasoning. And I remember the next trapping season, I became very adept at digging up my traps. And in one case, I actually dug up a trap, flipped it over, didn't set it off, and, and defecated on top of the trap. Looking for a coyote den has gotten a lot harder in recent years. Female coyotes are more on edge, constantly moving their den sites at night. And there's a good reason. The coyote's arch enemy, the wolf, is back in the Lamar Valley. In 1995, gray wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone after an absence of almost a century, and they immediately began killing coyotes. Eden's laboratory suddenly became a wild battlefield again. To survive, coyotes quickly adopted new tricks, becoming more unpredictable and always on the lookout. Almost overnight, coyotes became animals forged in a war. In a new world Eden, an epic natural drama is unfolding. It's a struggle for survival. Another battle in an ancient war reignited by a predator's return. After an absence lasting most of the 20th century, reintroduced gray wolves have had a dramatic impact on the animals of Yellowstone's Lamar Valley. There are now 165 wolves in the park, with some packs numbering as many as 37 wolves. Bob Crabtree has observed the wolves return from the beginning. Gathering in large packs, they can take on the most powerful bulls in a herd of bison. It's a classic Western showdown, a game played for keeps and watched by these researchers many times in recent years. While the standoff often becomes a stalemate, wolves have quickly reestablished themselves at the top of the Lamar Valley food chain. Human hunters eliminated wolves from Yellowstone almost a century ago. Now that they're back, wolves have gone to war against the coyotes that occupied this territory while they were gone. The wolves are merciless, killing but not eating most of the coyotes they encounter. Uh, you're breaking up, Dan, if you want to reorient and try again. The evidence suggests that there is competition between wolves and coyotes, but uh, the amount of uh, mortality of wolves and coyotes is a bit surprising. We didn't think the uh, potential for competition would be as great as it appears to be. The return of gray wolves here, halfway through Bob Crabtree's 13-year coyote study, has become the perfect opportunity to study how coyotes are capable of surviving so well under extreme pressure. But the wolves' return has not been a complete disaster for the coyotes. Grazing animals killed by wolves are a rich and easy source of food once the pack has eaten their fill and moved on. Problem is, there's often a long lineup for the leftovers. Grizzly bears also have a taste for the carcass of an adult pronghorn, and for this mother and cub, it's an opportunity to combine mealtime and playtime.
For the quick and stealthy coyote, Wolf Territory is the deadliest gourmet restaurant on earth. The grizzlies are more relaxed. For them, wolf kills are like takeout. They can eat quickly and then move on through the valley. Finally, it's the coyote's turn, and even now the kill is a fat reward, equal to gorging on several hundred ground squirrels. All alone but still nervous, this coyote has learned that being fast, bold, and cautious is the only way to survive alongside the wolves. Well, there's a lot of incentive for them to sneak into these wolf kills. And if they're not killed, they win and produce more pups. But you can imagine in the center part of a, a wolf territory where the wolves are spending all their time, the mortality rates are high. In fact, in those cases, there's been an 80% reduction in coyote numbers. Living with wolves is a stressful lifestyle for most of the Lamar Valley's wild creatures. No longer top dog, the coyote gets more than its fair share of the blame. But it's a stressful life for the coyotes too. They need to keep a safe distance from the wolf packs, but they also want to remain as close as they can to rich and very dependable sources of food. Deliberately tempting death has made them more cunning and extremely adaptable. Researchers have found that it's also made coyotes more prolific. Breeding alphas are killed constantly, forcing coyotes to reproduce at a rapid rate. But with more food, more pups will survive to adulthood. Coyotes seem to have evolved a specialized set of population tools to compensate and rebound very rapidly. In fact, it almost seems to be that they, they do better in a state of flux. They've evolved to this constant mortality factor. We're really out to find this den, but that's such a big open area that they'll rarely see them. But the chance of them seeing one of these two adults crossing the road is really pretty darn good in the next two weeks. Yeah, it's Just like this morning. Yeah, yeah, there's going to be more interactions. And... Searching for the recently moved den site, the researchers are hoping to observe one of the elusive adult coyotes return to feed the pups. First before we go up there. If wolves are killing a third of them every year, Think about the surviving individuals and how much smarter they are. And all over, you know, tens of thousands of years, all the different behavioral strategies coyotes are gonna pick up and how much selection pressure there is to weed out the not so smart and to create uh, what some folks have called more of a super coyote. And these new super coyotes have powerful survival skills. They're flexible in their habits, move up or down the food chain, and breed rapidly when under attack. How are you doing over there, Molly? Well, earlier, Diane spotted two adult coyotes. It has a great strategy to exist in wartime conditions with the wolf exploiting it. So when humans come in and kill half the coyotes, they've got an evolutionary uh, bag of tools and tricks ready to use to survive and reproduce. The ancient war with wolves transformed coyotes into nature's most adaptable species. But outside the protection of parks, humans killed off almost all of North America's wolves, allowing the cunning coyote to move right in. Today, the war of survival continues, except now the battlefield is an entire continent, and coyotes are turning up in the most unlikely places. Since the early 1980s, the small eastern Canadian province of Prince Edward Island has had a growing problem on its hands. After a 4,000 kilometer journey from Yellowstone, through vast forests, fields and cities to the Atlantic coast, it's believed coyotes crossed a frozen ocean channel to reach this quiet island of fishermen and farmers. How quiet was Prince Edward Island before coyotes arrived? So quiet, it's said that someone once called the wildlife nuisance hotline to complain about a problem trout. For coyotes, compared to Lamar Valley, living here is like winning a lottery. With no wolves, plenty to eat, and even more places to hide, coyotes are transforming the island. The red fox was the first to be dramatically affected. Foxes used to be a rare sight here, keeping their dens well hidden, deep in the forest. But coyotes quickly took over the best den sites and pushed the smaller foxes out of their preferred habitat. Now, for safety, 
the island's foxes live right beside humans. On Prince Edward Island, coyotes live in the forest and raid farms, mostly for mice. But they'll also eat calves, pigs, sheep, dogs, chickens, geese, even apples, and the island's famous potato crop. Farmers like Elmer Larson are getting tired of feeding these gourmand coyotes. He loses money every time he loses a calf. Some farmers claim to have lost 10% of their newborns, but so far, no one can agree on how to solve the problem. I tried through the Federation of Agriculture, which I was a member of at the time, for to uh, have them apply a bounty when they first discovered them and see that they were, they were wiped out and never allow them to uh, build up. But uh, these, these biologists, oh, I was clean out of my head to talk about something like that, that they'll find their own level and control themselves. Well, their own level is, is when there's, they control themselves when there's nothing left to eat. No one knows how many coyotes live on the island, but researcher Sarah Field hopes to find out. She's radio collaring coyotes as part of the first field study of this population. Uh, if we use a spot right here, it'll kind of act as a bath yeah. with the ferns in the yeah. home. Yeah. Coyotes will pick up on the fact that there's been fresh dirt turned over, and they'll know that something's on the go. Tracking the coyotes' movements with radio collars will help determine their densities on the island, but she has to catch them first with pain-free traps. The coyote is really the first predator on the island that could actually pose a threat to livestock producers. We used to have wolves, but they were eradicated long before any of the farmers here would have kind of developed their techniques. We did have black bears as well, but again, they were exterminated. Across North America, study after study has found that attempts to exterminate coyotes is very expensive and practically impossible. On Prince Edward Island, it was decided not to put a bounty on coyotes. But now, no one knows what to do next. Sheep farmer Carol McLeod has the island's largest sheep farm. Keeping her lambs from being slaughtered has become a lot harder since coyotes arrived. Sheep are uh, fairly easy for a coyote to get if they get into the flock. Um, sheep don't have a natural protective mechanism. They kind of stand around and stamp their feet, which doesn't scare too many <laughs> animals. Um, so it's pretty easy prey for the coyotes. For thousands of years, humans have bred sheep to be slow and plump. For an animal with the survival instincts of a coyote, sheep are evolution's way of gift wrapping a free lunch. We had just done a 50-day wait. It's something we do to predict how well the mothers are doing at raising their young. And we had just done that a few days before. And the coyote actually picked out the biggest best, healthiest lamb in the lot, which was amazing. Some farmers have decided to shoot coyotes on sight, but Carol McLeod believes her best defense is an electric fence. If you can't kill them off, at least keep them out. The coyote's nature is to go up and sniff the fence and go under something rather than jumping over it. We concentrate more on getting those low wires the right distance. It has to be only five inches from the ground. And the ground isn't uh, even all the way along. So we have to have a lot of posts and spacers to make sure it's just five inches. With its farmers under siege, Research into the island's elusive coyote population is slowly catching up. Sarah Field thinks there may be four times as many coyotes here than the current best estimates. And from the ones she's collared so far, she also believes these eastern coyotes are growing larger. But what's really happening on the edge of these farmlands? All Sarah knows for sure is that the coyote population is growing. What I'm finding so far is that they're having a much smaller home range as well as possibly traveling in family groups. So the chances are is that the capacity of the island to hold coyotes is much larger than just a thousand. In 
In eastern North America, the shapeshifter is changing in unexpected ways. Scientists are baffled, forcing farmers like Lomer McDonald to become instant coyote experts in order to protect their livestock and livelihood. Lomer's got his own ideas on dealing with coyotes and a unique solution. As long as they don't bother me, and as long as they don't start stealing any of my cattle, they're my friend. But when they start that, they're my enemy. And God help them. That there little hole that's right up on top there, that's where we, uh, we set the camera up there. Got a little platform inside and the camera sits up there. And then it faces down in that opening towards the woods. I got a light set up down there on the top of the trees and it lights it up. Coyotes are most active at night. And so Lomer set up a surveillance camera, put out some meat as bait and presto. Homegrown reality TV coverage of the animal everyone's worried about. I wanted to see how many we really had around here, you know, and, and I figured it was a good way of finding out how many was here and how close they come to the buildings. If it's a good moonlight night, lots of food down there, they come between 2 and 2.30 in the morning, and, and that's, that's there every night. They'll eat practically near anything that they, that's eatable. Lomer's surveillance camera has yielded some important information. If a coyote pack is fed, they won't eat cattle. The amount of electrical fencing required to fence in a cattle herd would bankrupt most farmers, so Lomer's solution is simple. If you can't beat them, why not feed them? The cows will walk right down past the coyotes, and the coyotes will just move away, like, you know, they'll let the, let the cows walk through. We can go down to the butcher shop and get a bunch of stuff, put it out behind the barn. They feed themselves, and they'll not hurt the animals as long as they're getting fed. Everything's got to get fed, you know. And since I started baiting them and putting food out for them, I've never lost a cow or anything. So I, I find it's a lot cheaper to feed them than it is for them to feed themselves. As coyote populations expand and adapt rapidly to new territories, local solutions may not work for long. Across North America, coyotes are getting bolder. Five thousand kilometers due west of Prince Edward Island, the city of Vancouver on Canada's Pacific coast is an urban jungle on the edge of the western world. Coyotes arrived here about 20 years ago, and now Vancouver has its own growing problem. Wildlife biologist Christine Lampa has watched coyotes adapt quickly to the big city. They're cautious and elusive, hiding their dens well in the thick underbrush of places like Stanley Park, in the city's downtown core, close to people, but out of sight. It's surprising that coyotes use this part of the park, um, considering it's right under the Lionsgate Bridge. But maybe not. Maybe that's why they're using it. Uh, people don't frequent this area of the park as much as other areas. And so it's a bit of a refuge inside of a refuge here for them. There's lots of understory for them to hide in, so we may even be being watched by a coyote right now as we're walking along. Coyotes have learned that this lush, urban rainforest is an ideal place to hunt. New food sources and new territories here are ripe for the taking. Now the local wildlife population has a new dominant player. If raccoons aren't pleased, there's not much they can do about it, except stay out of harm's way. In recent years, coyotes have gotten even bolder. They've slipped out of the forest into the city's open spaces. Today, coyotes can be found in backyards, back alleys, and even the back nine on the golf course. It may not look like home, but any open green space is a luxury.
Ever curious, coyotes will try anything to see if it's edible. After all, survival in the city is all about being open to change. Eggs that fall from the sky seem very tempting, if not exactly nourishing. And for at least one lucky human, the gods of golf have devised a new and painless way to escape a sand trap. Outside of the golf course, the urban world is a much tougher place. Cars and trains take a heavy toll, but coyotes survive by seizing opportunities. They've adapted well to the fast-paced, eat-and-run style of the city and will dine on whatever is readily available. Vancouver's urban wildlife managers have witnessed rapid changes in the coyote population. Coyotes have become increasingly bold and brazen. I've actually had some people whose dogs, small dogs, were attacked while they were on leash. Another of evolution's gift-wrapped packages, small dogs are a dietary delicacy to the coyote and in high demand within the pack. But there may be more than just food on the line. In Yellowstone, gray wolves kill coyotes, and dogs are domesticated descendants of wolves. Perhaps in Vancouver, coyotes are simply getting their revenge. After all, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. In the case of larger uh, dogs, stories are legend about how one coyote will lure them to the larger group to try and attack uh, a larger animal. It happens quite regularly. It is a matter of some concern. I mean, we have uh, started programs in the uh, city of Vancouver to advise and to warn people about uh, proper care and uh, you know, the appropriate care for their pets. Coyotes have now captured the city's attention. When wildlife get out of hand, Dennis Pemble is called in to deal with the problem. Right in the city we get deer, we have had bears and we've had cougars. They're quite rare, I have problems with them, but they do happen. But our main problem is the coyote. We've had people actually bitten. In Vanier Park, right nearby here, a little girl was bitten, um, and people were chased into the houses, and the coyote was very, very aggressive, and that went on for actually quite a while before we decided we had to remove that coyote. Six-year-old Kayla Hansen was walking right here behind her father doing... when she encountered a coyote. Well, this is right where he came out, eh? Yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Coyote was sleeping right there, and he started chasing me. Where were you? Where? I was right here. My friend was behind me. Were you playing together? No. You just walking up the stairs? Yeah. What, what happened with the coyote? He leapt out and did he bite you? Or? Yeah. He just he stained my dress first. And he, well, what did he do? Did he he stained my dress. I tried to get him off, and then he bit my arm. We have, I think, two coyotes that have. Uh, I know, I know, I know what to do about this. I called the police and they just keep transferring me to other numbers. So I mean, I was one of their other kids in the neighborhood. So I don't know what you can do about it. I think you should shoot the guy. And I have my young uh, in my yard. Grab my cat. Here for three hours. The big city is a thin veil stretched over a living, wildly evolving earth. Nature can be held back. But the coyote's success proves it can't be controlled. Vancouver is in a state of alarm. Where do coyotes fit in the urban world? It seems to me that coyotes are sort of at that cusp of the larger mammal species that could live in a city with some sort of tension and, um, you know, a, a, a problem set that goes with that, but they could exist here in a, a, a nervous harmony. And I think coyotes are teaching us things, maybe things we don't necessarily want to learn yet. The coyote's in-your-face attitude is challenging humans to respond. What can be done? The easy answer is to eliminate them as soon and as fast as possible. But it's been proven time and again that extermination simply doesn't work. The shapeshifter always returns, and stronger every time. Is there another way? The time is running out for answers. Most wild animals try to stay away from the human world, but not coyotes. They've proven to be fearless and adapted to the modern landscape quite well. 
It's an astonishing story of transformation that took less than a hundred years. And it's not over yet. In Prince Edward Island, coyotes seem to be growing larger, as if they're sneaking animal steroids on the sly. Biologists Randy Dibley and Sarah Field are trying to find out how and why these coyotes are changing. The red phase, uh, a bit more common in the Maritimes, you'll see it, but these black ones are a little bit rarer. But again, uh, we were talking about this earlier, about uh, the, the size that the eastern coyote has. It's more typical of Lighter. what you'd find in yeah. wolves. And this one here is kind of kind of neat because I had had a dog that almost resembled this whole color pattern. Sarah Field has sent eastern coyote tissue samples to geneticist Dr. Brad White at Ontario's Trent University. Here, Brad and his assistant, Aria Johnson, are studying the genetic relationships between coyotes and wolves. Coyotes almost never breed with dogs or the larger gray wolves of Yellowstone Park, but DNA extracted from eastern coyote samples has proven that they indeed carry the wolf gene. How it got there has only one possible explanation. Female coyotes are breeding with the smaller, forest-dwelling eastern wolf, and in the process, a new gene has been introduced into the coyote population. Now, evidence in both the field and the laboratory suggests that the eastern coyote is evolving rapidly into an animal just as adaptable and cunning as any coyote, but only larger, just like a wolf. It's a surprising new scientific discovery. Here we've got a very interesting mix, which we call the Canis soup. And the Canis soup really has been formed by this hybridization between the original western coyote, the eastern wolf, and now the um, gray wolf to, to the north. And so um, there isn't sort of a discrete species barrier um, the way we like to think of species. But I do think we are witnessing the creation of the most successful top-end predator in landscapes that have been impacted by humans. The so-called super coyotes of Yellowstone were forged in a war with wolves. Now, in eastern North America, they're making another startling evolutionary leap by turning into cunning, adaptable wolves. Soon enough, they'll be a genetic wonder dog sitting on top of the natural world's food chain for many years to come. On Prince Edward Island, researchers are observing the changes that support this new discovery. Typically in a wolf pack, you'll have a, an actual a, a dominance hierarchy where you'll have an alpha male and an alpha female. And it'll only be those two that actually reproduce. What we're seeing in the island population of coyotes is we're seeing a form of dominance hierarchy similar to that of a wolf pack. But although these coyotes may look like wolves, field evidence suggests that most of them still prefer to eat mice or rats, and so far only a small number actually hunt farm animals. These may be the problem coyotes that we want to address more so than coyotes as a whole. If you have a good coyote in your area, it's just as well to keep it, not try and get rid of it. On the opposite side of the continent, Vancouver's coyote problem is also reaching a crisis point. The urban coyotes here are the smaller western subspecies, but there's so many of them, they're causing a panic. Traumatized pet owners have lost cats and dogs, and several children have been bitten. Something has to be done, but what? Coyotes are hard to trap, and even harder to shoot. Local biologists have learned that human-biting coyotes always turn out to be human-fed coyotes. And so the answer might be to simply scare the animals away. To encouraging people to actively discourage them when they see them. So that really means if they're in your yard, turn on the hose, throw pots and pans at them, hurl a pine cone, use a water gun. Like there's all these kind of zany sounding ways of scaring them off. What they need to do is see different things that scare them. They think, God, these people, they are so unpredictable, I'm gonna stay clear. And that's the, that's the response we want. But sometimes a coyote's own curiosity can get it into serious trouble. The big city is a lot more dangerous than a few hurled pine cones. For this scared young pup, its life and death struggle seems to be over. 
But some humans, like these animal rescue officers, are a kinder, gentler breed. We're doing a booming business. We're averaging about 40 admissions a day. Wow. Yeah. It's this coyote's lucky day. She'll survive, but the mortality rate in the urban jungle is high, and over 50% of coyote pups won't reach adulthood. For her size even, um, it's not unusual for her to even get nailed by a, an eagle or something like that. So when they're even a predator, has predators, so um, especially puppy size like this. Once they're strong enough to survive, rescued coyote pups are released outside the city. It's all part of the evolving live and let live relationship between coyotes and humans. If they can't be eliminated, coexisting with coyotes rather than killing them seems to be the best long-term strategy. It could be the shapeshifter's best survival trick of all, forcing humans to adapt to them. There's an old First Nation legend that says coyote invented death to make living creatures take life more seriously. But the plan backfired when its own pups died. Overcome by grief, coyote set out to get revenge on death by becoming the ultimate survivor. Legend or not, coyotes are the 21st century's most successful species. Not because they're the fastest, the strongest, or have the biggest teeth. Coyotes survive because they can adapt to a changing world better than any other animal on the continent. I don't think it's her. Back in the Lamar Valley, Bob Crabtree is still searching for his elusive coyote den. It's not easy to find a den that's been hidden from wolves, but after years of observation, he's developed a keen coyote spotting eye. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Oh, I got her. All She's right. going up the hill. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, look across the creek, going up the hill. There's a gal. Yeah, all right, I got her. Got across you. Across the creek. Okay, so Across the creek, going up the hillside, and all the uh, balsam root. All right, she's going to go. Yeah, good, good, good. You got good. her? Yep. Oh, wow, wow, that's a long her? ways. Nine mm -hmm. for nine, Sheldon. We got her. Only weeks old, these young pups are completely dependent on their parents. It's exciting to find them at last. Obviously, she's got a safe den up there. It's worked. For up to a year, the vulnerable pups will stay close to their parents, learning, for the most part, how to live beside the wolves. Once they're fully grown and well-equipped with powerful survival skills, they'll be able to adapt to a changing world inside and outside the park. A lot of wildlife conservation issues deal with declining or rare species. And here you have a coyote that is not rare or declining. In fact, it's increased its distribution and it's a very successful critter in the face of high mortality rates. I think as wildlife conservationists, we ought to look at some of these ubiquitous successful species and maybe there's some lessons we can learn from them that we can apply to some of these rare and declining species. In our world, the coyote's incredible success is almost impossible to comprehend. They've achieved what no other animal has ever been able to do. Live side by side with humans in virtually every corner of North America. Today, coyotes go where they please, and wherever they go, they leave a trail of amazing stories. The shapeshifter is nature's wandering wild spirit, and for those who haven't seen it, there's no need to worry. The coyote is on its way.